We're really pleased this evening to be joined by my very good friend, Martine Lewis. And Martine has been a foster carer for many, many years, and she was just the perfect person to come and share with us tonight about her heart and her love for people who are not always feeling like they've got a home. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for asking me. I was really chuffed when you asked. <laughs> and the thing is, what you think that you see in other people, you don't see yourself. And I think that's another key thing with fostering, is that um, the children don't always see the beauty that's in themselves. Mm. But we do. And they think of all the negative things about themselves. But we don't. And can you tell us, how did you come to be a foster carer? Okay, so I used to work in Merthyr, and as there's those flipping roadworks that are still there now, it was there 15 years ago. And then um, I married Peter, my second husband, and I used to travel from further down west to go through to Merthyr every day. And what used to be um, the old Barverstocks Hotel had this massive billboard outside which said, have you ever thought about fostering? And it was something like, I want to foster.com. And it seemed like every day when the traffic lights turned red, I was either the car sat right in front or one behind every day. And I just kept looking at it thinking, is somebody trying to tell me something here? And I just thought, why not? And that was it. So I went and told, <laughs> I had this brilliant idea, my poor husband, I don't think I'd be married to him a year. And uh, decided that uh, I wanted to give up work, which was a bit of a stupid thing really to think of. Um, and I wanted to become a foster carer because I'd only had one child biologically and I didn't think I'd be able to have one child. So I thought, right, I've got the one. But I really liked being a mother, and I was not maternal until I had a baby. And all of a sudden, I became very maternal, very protective, and a bit like a mother hen. And a mother hen only had one egg to cut, and I needed a few more. <laughs> so I just had to convince my husband that this was the right thing. So I went home and asked him, have you ever thought of fostering? And he said, no. And then went swimming, and then this advert comes on the radio and says, have you ever felt about fostering? Have you ever thought about this? Have you, how would you feel? And I thought, well, it's straightforward. I got a spare room. There's children needs house. It's a bit of a no brainer. So I said, to him, <laughs> coffee came into it. And I said, do you fancy going for a coffee and a cake? So it seems to be a bit of a thing in our house that if you want something, you take out, out of the house so it becomes a neutral zone. Yeah. I ply my husband with coffee, which I don't drink. And then I asked him the same question. I said, have you ever felt about, how do you feel? Have you ever felt? And he said, I've told you no. And I just sat there and cried. And he was like, what is wrong with you? Because I said, I really feel God's telling me we need to foster. And he said, well, you've never said that. And he said, why? So I told him about stopping at these, these traffic lights. And I told him about hearing it, even when we were like swimming at this rage. He said, it won't leave me go. There's this voice telling me constantly, you need to become a foster carer. So we did. And that was it. <laughs> we applied. Um, it took a long time and it took a lot longer than what I thought it was. So I gave up my jo job a year too quick, yeah. really. Um, but God just got us through it all. And mm -hmm. it, was in, it, it was incredible. It was, it's hard, but not in a negative way, because it's hard because all of a sudden you hear about different case studies and my heart was breaking for these children. And I just thought... I got to do something about this. And it's not always that, like, you know, sometimes you hear so many bad stories that children come with all this baggage. Mm. And sometimes they do, but they don't always. Sometimes parents might just not be able to cope. Yeah. And they just need a home for a short time. And sometimes it's a bit more of a long haul. But whatever it is, 
I would recommend anybody to do it. Yeah. I really would. Because it's so rewarding, not only for the children, but for yourself. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, you were seeing these children, which are nine times out of ten frightened, mm. because it doesn't matter what's going on in their world, that's the only world they've ever known. Yeah. And all of a sudden, they give in to people that they don't know, mm -hmm. and saying, these people are going to look after you. What do you do? So how do you convince these children that it's a safe place for you? But it is, without a doubt, the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. Ever. I was going to ask you about that. I think a lot of people I've spoken to in the past who fostered or maybe adopted, they say that they often hear people say to them, oh, those kids are so lucky. They're so lucky to have you. And their response to that is, oh, no, we are, more lucky we are the lucky them. ones because yeah. of what they've learned Absolutely. about themselves yeah. and what those children yeah. have given to them. Is that your experience oh, yeah, as well? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I've been a single mum for a long time, 12 years. And then all of a sudden, I've found love again. And now I'm expecting this man to change our livelihood because we had a cushy life, like, you know, my son was, was a teenager and um, we could have had the lions in the morning and we could have had more than three hours sleep. And now I'm trying to tell him the best thing we could possibly do is become permanently tired, smelling of sick and other things, but that's what happens. But the joy you get mm -hmm. when you can tell these children that they are loved and they are valued. And it doesn't matter if you want to run around the place, that's fine. It's making this safe environment, whether you live in a 12 bedroom house or a two bedroom flat, it doesn't make any difference. It's about making somewhere safe yeah. and secure where this child or children feel loved. And that is all it's about. It is nothing complicated. It's about saying no, which they don't like being told on time. Yes. But when? <laughs> I don't like being told no, you're right. I don't like being told no. But it's, 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 it's having boundaries and it's safety. But the main thing is this unconditional love. Mm -hmm. That Don't worry if you break a plant pot. Don't worry if you smash a mug. They are all replaceable. You aren't. Yeah. And that's such a key yeah. thing. That you can just, you know, to be like 52 now and still, if I can physically get down on the floor and be able to colour and do plasticine and to talk about Pokemon and to talk about all these amazing things, I'm not supposed to talk about as an adult because that's not what grown-ups talk about. And I'm a geek. I love the fact that, you know, you can have Doctor Who and Star Trek and flipping Marvel. Love it. But apparently, this is added bonus when you're fostering. Yeah. Because you can foster and think of more ways that you can interact with yeah. children. Whereas I thought my lack of education would stop me. But it seemed to be that the more I could be real, for want yeah. of a better word, the more it actually qualified me. It was nothing about having all levels, A levels, or degrees. In fact, it seemed that because I had none mm -hmm. and I'd had a divorce and I'd come from a broken marriage and all this seemed to equip me. To relate. Exactly. Yeah. Because life's not perfect for many of us. So earlier on, right at the start, um, Han read from uh, 1 John 4. And the last part of that says, the command we have from Jesus is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. Yeah. Kind of it's says it all, science, really, does it? it? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I think for people watching tonight, there might be some people who maybe are interested in hearing about foster care and, and all of that kind of stuff. And we'll put stuff up on the website so that people can check in with how they can help in whatever situation they find themselves in. But there might also be people who are watching tonight who have been through yeah. that system yeah. themselves. And you are a foster carer, as we've established, but you also are a prison chaplain. Yeah. And you kind of see the yeah. care journey 
and how that can work out yeah. for people from that dimension as well. Yeah, it doesn't always work out, which is why we need more foster carers. Mm -hmm. And we need more foster carers that don't see this as an occupation. Because mm -hmm. um, obviously you get paid to look after children and then there's a process of training. But if you can't love a child unconditionally, and some people say, oh, it, it, it's not working out. And sometimes it's sad and it, it is what happens. But I know one of the hardest things to do is to get the right fit. Mm -hmm. It's the right fit for the child, for the children, but it's the right fit for the family yeah. or for the single parent, the single man. Um, it's not always about having a, a woman because sometimes you have a child which might have been hurt by a woman. Mm -hmm. So needs a man yeah. on his own. So, you know, to encourage a single man to be able to do this. There isn't about this rose-tinted spectacles, husband and wife and the dog. This is everybody is needed to consider it. And um, as part of the fostering training, I, I can't remember what it is now, but the statistics of failed, um, how was the right word to use? Placements. Right, placements and the fact of just the whole system failing. Yeah. And nobody wants anything like this to fail. Um, but it was something that it was 60 plus percent, which is a lot of children, mm. end up either in, um, in prison or in some sort of institute where things haven't worked out right. There is a time when there is a gray area of where the duty of care is between 16 and 18 because they can come out of the fostering area at 16 and they can go and live independently, yeah. as can our biological children. But who looks after them? Yeah. And sadly, not everybody has got um, an extended family or have got a lot of close friends. Mm. And sometimes you find that sort of friendship and family in the wrong place. Yeah. And that's sadly what I see every day is that sometimes it ends up coming in and ends up being in prison. Mm. But again, I think that was another reason why I felt God had really put the prison service on my heart, because he'd also dropped this fostering on my heart. And it's the fact of, and I am, like I said, I'm a mother in, and I go in and I think of the boys that I go and see, the men, and it's the fact of, being able to be confident, to be me, yeah. whereas blue haired, overweight, and everything the society thinks I shouldn't be, or tattooed as well, that, you know, all of a sudden God's got a purpose for me, yeah. and it's flipping awesome, because I can go in in the morning and go, hello, my gorgeous is, how are you? And some of them are older than me, <laughs> and they're like, oh, look out, here she comes. And some will laugh, some will retreat and run as fast as they can. But others like having that warmth. And I just think that's what God has called me to be, is yeah. to love unconditionally. I don't care, I don't judge, and that way normally nobody judges me. I've just been called to be me, as you've been called to be Jess. Exceptionally talented, beautiful, very frustrating for the rest of us. But this is what we are called to do. Yeah. And I love going into my job. I feel it's a real privilege. I felt it's been a privilege to be a foster carer. But I also see the privilege with prison work is I get to be able to come in alongside people and just say, are you okay today? Mm. My boss is forever giving me a row for calling people darling, babe, sweetheart, sugar. And she said, you can't speak like that. I said, yeah, but I'm on the menopause. I can't remember people's <laughs> names. So I said, it doesn't matter who they are. I've got to call them something. I can't go, oi. I said, because that's wrong. So I go, oh, yes, sweetheart, how are you? And sometimes they say, uh, fine. And I would go, well, you're saying fine, but your body's not looking mm. fine. What's going on? And of course, it's all socially distanced and like everything is very safe. But it's just sitting down mm. and saying, what's going on? Yeah. Because not everybody gets that. But they don't always get that outside prison walls either. Yeah. And it's just being able to, to create that environment again of safety 
when you can say, you okay? Mm. Same as when I had my children, when I became a foster carer, it's like, you're in this area, are you okay? Because yeah. you're in my care now. Yeah. So it's foster care fortnight, and the hashtag that they've been using on social media is hashtag why we care. <laughs> and when I read that, that was part of the reason we chose the one John reading, is because the very opening says, God is love. So for us, knowing God is love, being filled with that love, it's what we want to do, right? We want yeah, to give like, that love out. again, no, because, yeah. Um, and it's the thing of knowing that love yeah. ourselves. So I'm going to take this off now because I don't want people thinking that I'm only doing this because of me being a priest, about me being training. It has got nothing to do with that. I wish I'd been told as a single mum, if I had a spare bedroom, I could have done this. I wasn't told anything. People didn't speak about fostering. Mm. It is not about being qualified. As I've said, with qualifications, A-levels, GCSEs, all that, meant nothing. Yeah. It's just about having that capability of creating safety. And it's about being able to be me. Mm. That is who we are qualified to be. It's about you being Jess, being so unfairly gifted in so many things and it's about me and it's all right it's, it's okay i'm not a size eight it's okay i i am now a, a proud blue card holder registered disabled right it is okay we've all got things we can do and again it's that beauty of god showing you unconditional love yeah. so we can keep on filling it up filling it up so we can give it out it's the fact of being greedy and giving it out it's yeah. being greedy i want more of god more of god and then all of a sudden he's like yeah but have you ever thought to foster no i can't cope yes you can of course you can i love you more i love you more i give you all this and then you think oh, but now i can give it away yeah. and that is what is just so exceptional about mm -hmm. God it's us getting it and holding on to it but then it's when it's the right time we give it away yeah. for others yeah. and that is how I think that Jesus has called all of us to do we're all called to be disciples we're all called to have these amazing stories mm -hmm. about how God works in our lives yeah. but the most amazing thing God taught me was that I was loved yeah. I was able to love. Yeah. And it's the fact you pass this on to your children. The most important thing that we can teach our children is to love somebody, mm. to love themselves, but for them to trust in a way that they can accept love yeah. and they can love yeah. others. Yeah. And I mean, and in the Bible, it says the most important thing is loving God. And the next yeah. most important yeah. thing is loving your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. So it's a requirement, isn't it? And it's not easy. It's not easy, but it's not complicated, no, is it? Like we make it complicated. Yeah. And sometimes, even if you take it to the literal, your neighbours, you can't always get on, or on <laughs> with somebody. And nobody wants a blue-head, hormonal psychopath living next door to them. I completely get that. But when they get to know the person, yeah. and again, this is loving people, it's like, you know, people say to kill with kindness in a lovely way that you, you can just love people. Mm. And they just, in the end, they'll give in to me. They, they always do. <laughs> and it's just the fact of, you know, I want to be loved. But there is nothing better than loving. Mm. And, like, I've got three mammies boys now who, even if they are 26, long-haired, tattooed, whatever are quite happy to still hold his mother's hand, mm. as are the other two. And especially now, because I've got arthritis in my back, sometimes I need somebody to hold on to. There's never a, do you mind? All of a sudden, it's, mum needs me. And that's fabulous. Yeah. And that's what I love, being as a mother. Never thought I would, because yeah. I haven't got a motherly bone in my body. <laughs> But again, God says, I got a better plan for you. Yeah. And I, everything that you tell me, I'm confessing. I can remember standing in church years and years and years ago, standing there saying, God, here I am, 
send me, but please not kids' work. Please don't <laughs> give me children, right? I'm confessing, Sunday school petrifies me. Put me in the prison any day of the week. Don't give me Sunday school. Next thing you know, he's telling me, no, I want you to do Sunday school. My husband saying to me a few years later, we, we, we need a Sunday school, and I'm petrified. Please don't make me do that. And then I find out I actually quite like children. And it's like, where's this fear come from? And who am I to stand before God and give him agenda of what I want to do and what I'm not prepared to do? And you say, like, well, I don't want to do that. And God goes, don't you? I got a plan for you. And I got news for you, love. It's not about what you want. It's what I want you to do. And again, it's submitting to that love that God knows best. Yeah. It's that perfect father, that perfect parent mm -hmm. we can only ever dream of being like. But we're only ever called to be us. Yeah and to be a parent to those children that God puts in your mm. way. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, I quite like these. <laughs> and they, they're amazing. They've completely changed our lives. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, and that is a perfect place to end our conversation. I could listen to you talk all night. You're just such an inspiration, and you're just captivating. And yeah, thank you. Oh. And you know I can talk all the time. <laughs> I know, but just thank, thank you. you so much for being here and for sharing the love that you've got with us. It's just been amazing. Thank you.